Hi, I'm David McMahon, first vice president of the National Communication Association. Welcome to the 2020 Carol C. Arnold Distinguished Lecture. Each year, the Arnold Lecture features the most accomplished and highly regarded scholars in the discipline of communication. And this year is certainly no exception. Dr. Thomas K. Nakayama is professor of communication studies at Northeastern University. With work centered at the intersection of rhetoric, intercultural communication, and critical theory, Dr. Nakayama is co-author or co-editor of numerous books, including Intercultural Communication in Context, Experiencing Intercultural Communication, Human Communication in Society, Wideness, the Communication of Social Identity, and the Handbook of Critical Intercultural Communication. Dr. Nakayama also serves on a number of editorial boards and is the founding editor of the Journal of International and Intercultural Communication and co-founding editor of QED, a journal in GLBTQ world making. Dr. Nakayama is a former Fulbrighter and has been named a distinguished scholar by the Western States Communication Association, a distinguished research fellow by the Eastern Communication Association, and a distinguished scholar by the National Communication Association. Now with the address titled, The Challenge of Global Whiteness, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce this year's Carol C. Arnold Distinguished Lecture Dr. Thomas K. Nakayama. I'm very grateful to David McMahon for inviting me to give the esteemed Carol C. Arnold Lecture this year. It's a tremendous honor and I thank him for this, uh, for this recognition. Today I want to speak about the challenge of global whiteness. It's been 25 years since I published my first piece on whiteness in an NCA journal in the Quarterly Journal of Speech with Robert Krizek. Um, at the time, one of the dominant themes that emerged from our studies on whiteness was its invisibility. Yet I've struggled over whiteness throughout my life and this emergence of the invisibility theme was something that was um, new to me um, because when I was growing up, whiteness wasn't invisible, it was very salient. Like many people of my generation, I started first grade in a segregated elementary school and graduated from a racially integrated high school after completion of the 12th grade. Indeed, there was only one high school in the county by then. In the years in between, I saw whiteness change and the dynamic character of it emerge. When the amusement park, Six Flags Over Georgia opened in 1967, there was an excitement about it at school. And I remember my brother coming home and talking about this new amusement park. Uh, I think my family went to the park in 1968, but before we went, my parents called the park, a relatively expensive long distance call back then to find out if they were open to everyone or if it was only open to whites. Unlike some previous amusement parks in the area, Six Flags Over Georgia was open to everyone from the beginning, from its opening. I'm telling this story to highlight how much whiteness has changed over the years. The many strategies that we learned to navigate whiteness in the dying years of Jim Crow don't seem to have much use today as the terrain and the game have changed tremendously. Over the years, I've watched the dynamic character of whiteness and the many ways it's changed over the years while retaining parts of its traditional interests. But whiteness develops new strategies to negotiate its position of power and privilege. This summer in July, 2020, an Asian American family was celebrating a birthday at a restaurant in Monterey, California, when a white male at a different table began yelling at them, screaming, quote, F you Asians, go back to whatever effing Asian country you're from <clears throat> and, and you don't belong here. He followed up with Trump's gonna F you as he stood up to leave, followed by you effing need to leave, you effing Asian piece of S. I'm leaving out the <laughs> words that you can fill in. When a server intervened and ordered him to leave. In the context of anti-Asian attacks across the United States, some of them very violent, this incident is just one of many. President Trump's naming COVID-19 as the Chinese virus or Kung flu has led the Washington Post to conclude, quote, such racialized language has prompted many Americans to blame Chinese Americans for COVID-19, end quote. In fact, the rhetor this rhetoric has led to anti-Asian attacks more generally as any need to make distinctions among Asian American ethnic groups has never been a high priority in the cultural logic of whiteness. This anti-Asian turn is not unique to the United States. Earlier, the hashtag Je suis pas un virus began trending on French Twitter and ich bin kein virus on German Twitter. Similar hashtags trended in other European languages as well in response to anti-Asian reactions to COVID-19 in 2020. 
I wanted to use this example because it highlights some of the issues at hand when we consider the challenge of global whiteness. As I explored more about the global place of whiteness and more it led back to the glo a global orientation to whiteness. It's important to note here that the perpetrator in the restaurant in Monterey, California was a man named Michael Lofthouse, who is the CEO of Solid 8, which is described as, quote, a cloud computing firm based in San Francisco. Lofthouse, it should be noted, is originally from the United Kingdom and moved to the United States about 10 years ago. Notably, he has a claim on American land and Americanness that Asian Americans do not. How can he tell this Asian American family to go back to whatever country they're from when there is no reflection on his own trajectory and any perceived need to go back to Britain? Whiteness has an international claim that other racial ethnic groups do not. He is rightfully here in his own mind as a white person in a way that the Asian American family is not. In the larger scheme of things, Lofthouse aggressive verbal behavior is a minor point in the entire history of the world. I am using this minor incident as it opens up a starting place for one of many global challenges of whiteness. Simply rolling my eyes at Lofthouse, Lofthouse does nothing to disrupt this cultural logic. The claims that others need to go home to go back to where they're from are deeply embedded rhetorical weapons that are always available to disenfranchise whomever falls outside the ever-changing umbrella of whiteness. Whiteness studies have been tremendously influenced by the work of the of the, and racial experience in the history of the United States. The experience and cultural logic of whiteness do not necessarily emerge uniquely from the United States. As whiteness studies have grown, there's been increasingly been work on whiteness in other nations, for example, Australia, Canada, and South Africa. They each have their own histories and trajectories within different legal, historical, and social institutions. While while specific national contexts do shape and influence the ways that whiteness functions, there are also transnational forces that shape the ways that race and whiteness are deployed. Whiteness does not operate in isolation. Today, I wanna to suggest uh, a more international view of whiteness, but with a focus on the influence of the United States and its expanse in the, in the terrain on whiteness. Much of the work on whiteness has focused on a narrow definition of, of the United States as a nation state, and much of my own work falls within that. But here I wanna make a turn toward thinking about whiteness on the global stage within the trajectory of the place of the United States. And what I wanna suggest here is that the conception of the United States needs to be a much more broader and comprehensive view of who we are and where we're going. And I want to suggest that whiteness has always been a global project. So I'm starting, I want to start with Ben Franklin prior to um, the uh, emergence of the United States as an independent country. Ben Franklin is an important touchstone for early conceptions of Americans. And despite not ever being president of the United States, his influence in the past and present is reflected in his image on the $100 bill. Some consider him to be among the most important and influential founding fathers, especially his work on the Declaration of Independence. However, in 1750, the Iron Act was passed by Britain, which encouraged the production of raw iron in North America, but limited production of iron products, iron products, such as tools and things like that made out of iron or steel products, which use iron to protect the manufacturing businesses in Great Britain. In effect, it was to severely hinder the development of a manufacturing infrastructure in the American colonies. In response to this, Ben Franklin wrote a pamphlet entitled Observations Concerning the Increase of Mankind in 1751. He was very concerned about the struggle between Britain and France over the future of North America, which was obviously on the front burner at the time. And the full title of his 1751 pamphlet is Observations on the Late and Present Conduct of the French with Regard to Their Encroachments Upon the British Colonies in North America, to which is added, wrote by another hand, observations concerning the increase of mankind, people and countries, etc. This rather unwieldy title reveals the motivation behind the pamphlet. He was concerned about whether North America becomes British or French, and the development of the industrial sector in the British colonies could very much help in that struggle which is part of the reason that uh, the argument that uh, is embedded in this particular pamphlet. In 1751, Ben Franklin's response to the Iron Act in pamphlet form was a major communication medium at the time. Pamphleteering was a wide known uh, forum for 
argument for making arguments in the political sphere. This pamphlet was widely distributed in Britain as well as the American colonies. It was reprinted in magazines in England and Scotland. Um, and we're probably most familiar with Tom Paine's Common Sense as a more familiar example of kind of pamphleteering. Franklin, in his pamphlet, made a much larger argument about the development of America that could be a powerful force in the world. Early on, he saw the potential of building a significant white colony that would be a global force in the future. He envisioned a powerful America in advancing whiteness, which he defined very narrowly as Anglo-Saxons. Benjamin Franklin was very concerned about the peopling of America, and a prototypical American argued against the, the, argued against the impact of Germans in Pennsylvania. In his pamphlet, he writes, why should Pennsylvania, founded by the English, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglifying them, and will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion. One important thing, end, end quote, one of the important theme in the global view of whiteness is assimilation into whiteness. So he lays out that he's concerned that they, the German immigrants, will never adopt our language or customs, which is a familiar argument that's made against all immigrant groups throughout the history of immigration in the United States. And second, that they will not change their complexion to match that of, of whites. So the two themes, assimilation and racialization, return again and again throughout the history of United States immigration. Some groups were blocked from immigration because of a sense that some people were unassimilatable and could not become white. It's important to note here that Franklin did not include most Europeans as truly white. In this particular pamphlet, he, he, he argues, in Europe, the Spaniard, quote, in Europe, the Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, and Swedes are generally of what we call a swarthy complexion, as are the Germans also. The Saxons only accepted who, with the English, make the principal body of white people on the face of the earth. I wish their numbers were increased. So in lamenting the lack of white people on the earth, I want to emphasize the global view that Franklin has about the paucity of white people on the planet. The project of nation building was intimately tied to the racial project of, of expanding the white population in the nation and ultimately in the world. He had an eye on the global place of, the, of this emerging nation in the world, and his focus was on population growth. His estimates on population growth were not far off the mark, even if his reasons for that growth were. For example, he opposed slavery as it reduced the fertility of whites. He writes, quote, the whites who have slaves not laboring are enfeebled and therefore not so generally prolific. So his, op end quote. So his opposition to slavery was about reproduction. The 1790 census counts just under 4 million people. This was the first census undertaken by the United States government. 100 years later, the 1890 census counted almost 62 million people, and by 2010, the census counted almost 309 million people. And in 1900, the census counted a little over 76 million people, of whom 66.9 million were classified as white, or about 88%. The latest census estimates, uh, and these are from 2010 because the 20, well, the 20 census results are not yet reported. 2020 census results are not yet reported. Um, but reports that 76% of the US population identifies as white. One of the things that um, it's important to note when looking at the census data is the label white is one that is among the most stable throughout the years. It only shifts from free white to white. And uh, other, all of the other categories have many, many more name changes. The Asian categories, the Hispanic, Spanish speaking uh, category also goes under tremendous name changes. Whiteness gives the appearance of being the most stable category, and yet there are tremendous changes that white undergoes. Here, I don't want to get into a history of the census, but uh, we know that there has been different groups that have been moved in and out of the white category. Uh, most famously, the Irish were moved in to the white category, and Asian, South Asians were moved out of the white category. And there's, and for the 2020 census, there was a tremendous debate about 
uh, whether or not Middle Eastern North Africans should continue to be counted as white or counted as some have, the, have a separate category. Ultimately, the Census Bureau decided to keep, to keep the classification system that they have, and those debates will probably reemerge for the 2030 census. The first census in Great Britain was in 1801 and showed a population of 10.5 million. So at the time, the United States was about a third of the population of Great Britain. The 1901 census reported a population of 30.5 million, or less than half of the United States. Today, the estimated population of the United Kingdom is 66.7 million, or about one-fifth of the United States. Ben Franklin's vision of a powerful white force, the United States, has come to fruition. He writes, quote, this million doubling, suppose, but once in 25 years will in another century be more of the people of England and the greatest number of the Englishmen will be on this side of the water. What an accession of power to the British Empire by sea as well as land. What increase of trade and navigation. What numbers of ships and seamen. We have been here but little more than 100 years and yet the force of our privateers in the late war united was greater both in men and guns than that of the whole British Navy in Queen Elizabeth's time, end quote. What Ben Franklin had grasped early on was the potential to build a formidable white population. In part, it was premised on his reasoning that, quote, hence the prince that acquires new territory, if he finds it vacant or removes the natives to give his own people room, end quote, was one of the keys to his nation building. Along with lawmakers, manufacturers, fishers, and farmers, they, quote, may be properly called fathers of their nation as they are the cause of the generation of multitudes, end quote. Franklin, of course, gives little or no justification for removal of the natives other than to make room for people to acquire new territory. Yet he foreshadowed the forced removal of entire Native American nations to Indian territory, which is Oklahoma, or reservations throughout, throughout the Midwest and West. Franklin's project, of course, looks quite problematic in hindsight, but it laid the path for a global whiteness. In Franklin's era, his concern would have been extended to questions of, of language as well. Communication was something that he, he, that he took seriously. In his era, he felt most threatened by the German language as it wasn't predetermined that would, English would become the lingua, lingua franca. Language has played a central role in the development of global whiteness. Although Latin was the lingua franca of Europe, it never attained the international status of English. Chinese is and was spoken as a native language by more people than European language, languages, but it never became the international language. French was able to make a much bigger impact on the international level. While spoken at the courts of Catherine the Great of Russia and Frederick the Great of Prussia, French did not have the same global status and widespread use around the world that, as English does today. Part of the project of eliminating other ways of communication has been the suppression of non-English languages. We know that slaves were not taught to read and write as a path to disempowerment. We know that slave laws forbade teaching slaves how to read and write. Well known are the federal Indian schools where native children were forbidden from speaking their native languages in favor of English. Similarly, California segregated schools such as the Oriental schools forbade the use of Chinese or Japanese languages among the students. The continuity of these languages was seen as without value and pot potentially threatening to the white social order. So in following Franklin's concern about German, the educational system followed Franklin by being concerned about immigrants not speaking English. It's almost as if speaking another language somehow diminishes the ability to speak English, which we know is not true. It also threatens the tight connection between um, whiteness and language and communication. Yet the separation of people who speak the same language is not easy. People want to be with others who speak their language. As a historian noted, quote, slave owners made a point of separating African slaves who spoke the same language, end quote. He concludes that the result, quote, was total linguistic annihilation, end quote. The decline of African languages in the United States was reflected in the purposeful decline of Native American languages as Indian schools insisted on civilizing the students, which meant in part speaking English. At the same time that this was going on, the British Empire was expanding across large parts of Africa, South Asia, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, and more. The history of education of native peoples in America is much more complicated than I have time or space for here, but I want to make a few note, note a few things that are worth noting. First, the missionaries were early on interested in teaching the native people. 
primarily for expansion of their religious, uh, their, their religion. While there were early educational efforts to teach English, the push for English really grew dramatically after the Civil War. When, at the time, President Grant appointed what he called Indian, Indian Peace Commissioners, um, whose charge was to bring an end to the Indian Wars that were taking place on the frontier. In their 1871 report, they wrote, in their 1871 report to Congress, they wrote, quote, now by educating the children of these tribes in the English language, these differences would have disappeared and civilization would have fallen at once, end quote. So here again, English and civilization go hand in hand. They continue, quote, through the sameness of languages produce sameness of sentiment and thought, customs and habits are molded and assimilated in the same way. And thus, in process of time, the differences producing trouble would have been gradually obliterated, end quote. So here they find the solution to the Indian wars and peace through teaching English. They continue, quote, in the difference of language today lies two thirds of our trouble. Schools should be established which children should be required to attend. Their barbarous dialect should be blotted out and the English language substituted, end quote. So here through coded language or not so coded language on civilization and thought, English becomes a critical tool of whiteness. English becomes the pathway in thinking a particular way, but it gets cloaked by, Commissioner Atkins, who's later uh, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, who tries to represent English as a transracial communication system and not when it, which he also connects to assimilation and whiteness. In 1887, when, as Commissioner of Indian Affairs, J.D.C. Atkins banned the use of native languages in Indian schools. In his report to Congress, Commissioner Atkins reported that, quote, it is believed that if any Indian vernacular is allowed to be taught by the missionaries in schools on Indian reservations, it will prejudice the youth, youthful pupil as well as his untutored and uncivilized or semi-civilized parent against the English language and to some extent at least against government schools in which the English language exclusively has always been taught. To teach Indian school children their native tongue is practically to exclude English and to prevent them from acquiring it. This language in, he's referring to English, which is good enough for a white man and a black man ought to be good enough for the red man. It is also believed that teaching an Indian youth in his own barbarous dialect is a positive detriment to him. The first step to be taken towards civilization, toward teaching the Indians the mischief and folly of continuing in their barbarous practices is to teach them the English language, end quote. He promotes English as a race neutral communication tool, but also as a civilizing, as a tool for civiliz civilizing and an alternative to what he called barbarous dialects or the native languages. But successful resistance to the imposition of English in the educational system would not come from non European languages in the judicial system. Interestingly, the challenge to many of the laws enforcing the use of English in schools arose not from American Indian schools, but from schools in the Midwest where German was being taught. In 1920, the Hamilton County attorney in Nebraska walked into the Zion Lutheran School and found the teacher, Robert Meyer, teaching reading German to a 10-year-old student, Raymond Parpart. He charged Meyer with violating the Seaman Act, a Nebraska law that forbade teaching any foreign languages up through the eighth grade. Meyer was found guilty through the court system uh, and appealed up to the Nebraska Supreme Court where he was also found guilty. His lawyer then appealed to the United States Supreme Court. Meyer, Nebraska, Meyer versus Nebraska was heard by the United States Supreme Court in 1923. By the time the case reached the United States Supreme Court, Nebraska had passed an even stricter law forbidding the teaching of foreign languages. And the Supreme Court took this case along with two other cases, one from Iowa and one from Ohio and combine them. Um, in a 7-2 decision, Justice James McReynolds wrote the majority opinion, quote, mere knowledge of the German language cannot reasonably be regarded as harmful. Heretofore, it has been commonly looked upon as helpful and desirable. The protection of the Constitution extends to all, to those who speak other languages, as well as to those born with English on the tongue. Perhaps it would be highly advantageous if all had been ready understanding of our ordinary speech, but this cannot be coerced by methods 
which conflict with the Constitution. A desirable end cannot be promoted by prohibited means, end quote. Of course, the German language, unlike many native languages spoken across North America, would not be seen as threatening to whiteness in the same way, as Germans had shifted into becoming whites by this, by this period. Also worth noting is that 1922 and 1923 saw two Supreme Supreme Court cases decided that reinforced a particular cultural logic about whiteness. In 1922, Ozawa versus the United States ruled that Japanese people are not scientifically classified as Caucasians, and so they are not white and therefore ineligible for U.S. citizenship. In 1923, the same year as Meyer versus Nebraska, the Supreme Court ruled in Tin versus United States that people born from India are classified as Caucasians, but in, a common, in the common sense rule, they are not seen as white and therefore they're ineligible for citizenship. The seeming acceptance of German and other languages hides the retrenchment of whiteness through scientific racialization coupled with the common sense approach to racialization. Although it might seem like a slight detour, let's jump to the establishment of the United States internment camps in the 1940s. The largest internment camp, Poston, and the model camp, Gila River, were built on American Indian reservations in Arizona. Poston, which was really three camps, Poston one, two, and three, was placed on the Colorado River Indian Tribes Reservation in Western Arizona. It is a reservation that's actually comprised of four tribes, Chiminueve, Hopi, Mojave, and Navajo. The Gila River camp was placed on the Gila River Indian Reservation, which is between Phoenix and Casa Grande, Arizona. There's some debate about the pronunciation of the of the name. Here I want to point to a particular cultural logic at work. The Colorado River Indian Tribes Reservation is comprised of four tribes, not by their own historical settlement, but by the removal of Hopi and Navajo to the original lands of the Chiminueve and Mojave people. The placement of Japanese Americans on this reservation adds to the reservation's history of relocation. The Gila River internment camp was considered the model camp for a number of different reasons. Uh, when First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt asked to visit one of the camps, she was taken to the Gila River camp. She seems to have understood some of the cultural logic of whiteness and pondered the consequences of her husband's uh, signing Executive Order 9066, ordering the internment of Japanese Americans. At the, upon seeing the camp, Eleanor Roosevelt declared, quote, the sooner we get the young native-born Japanese out of the camps, the better. Otherwise, if we don't look out, we will create another Indian problem, end quote. The potential for Japanese Americans to become yet another tribe puts, points to some interesting cultural logic about racial and ethnic categorization. Eleanor Roosevelt portends the racial categories for, portends that racial categorization of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders into a single group, two very different groups who share brown skin, but little else. Pacific Islanders, for example, Hawaiians and Samoans share concerns over indigenous land rights issues, native languages, and more with other native people. In contrast, Asian Americans share immigration concerns, citizenship rights, and more with other immigrant groups. The merging of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders into a single category reflects a lo cultural logic of whiteness that disrupts the reality of lived experience, history, law, and culture. But back to English. English uh, is a language that became, has become an international language through the development of technology as well as empire. The English language has no equivalent to the French language's Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, the international organization promoting French speaking, an <coughs> which pushes for the development of French around the world. Evidently, English never needed such, a, such an organization. And English is not hampered by the purity of language reflected in the Académie Française or the French Academy, a prescriptive ins institution that determines rules about the French language. In France, they're widely known as the Immortal Forties, as there are 40 people on the, French, on the French Academy. But outside of France, they're often called the language police. The French Academy tries to retain the purity of French and correct usage in French. So the Academy determines the grammar and vocabulary of correct French. It guards against the intrusion of other languages into French 
not only English, but English, of course, is one of the most powerful influences uh, in, in, Fran in the French language. So, for example, when cloud computing came into existence, the Academy had to determine the correct French equivalent, which they decided was informatique en nuage, which they insist that French people use instead of cloud computing. When COVID-19 entered the French language, they had to determine whether or not COVID-19 is a feminine word or a masculine word because it is a noun. And they decided that it's a feminine word and should be referred to as la COVID-19. While many people do use the masculine form, le COVID-19, it's not considered correct by the academy. So without a language academy, and People have written and speculated on many other reasons that English has taken off. English has been quite successful at becoming an international language. The British Empire played a tremendous role in the spread of English, as did the spread of Spanish, Portuguese, and French. Unlike those languages, however, the English language had the United States to take up the mantle of Anglophonie, from which the British had laid the groundwork and reinforced its importance in the 20th and 21st centuries. The establishment of the United States as a major force in the development of technology in the 20th and so far into the 21st century has been an important uh, aspect of the dissemination of technology along with language. So words like cloud computing and crowdfunding and so on have a tremendous impact in, in use of English around the world. English has become a far more international language than Latin, Esperanto, or French could ever become. The 20th century was the rise of the United States on the world stage, and the 1946 Foreign Service Act reflected the new American commitment to involvement around the world. As Wendy Leeds Hurwitz has pointed out, this act established the Foreign Service Institute, which has been a huge player in the development and history of intercultural communication. One thing I wanted to note is that in, earlier in 2020, this has been a very interesting year. The Oxford English Dictionary added 29 Nigerian English words to the English language. This is significant in that the Anglophone world is recognizing the many ways that English is spoken around the world, including Nigeria, and it is open to the many varieties of English. The openness of English, in contrast to French, to change in new ways of speaking English is a powerful and potentially useful tool, tool for both reinforcement forcing whiteness as well as resisting whiteness. This is a global project and the rhetoric of global whiteness is grounded in this history. We are all engaging in the whiteness of English, but the openness of English to other ways of speaking English can plant the seeds for challenging the global dominance of whiteness. As I argued with Robert Kresik, we have to consider the ways that whiteness is a strategic rhetoric. It emanates from a position of power. It's powerful, claims to be being rightfully in a particular piece of land by whites, whether they're legally citizens or not, is a strategic claim of belonging. It's a form of settler colonialism that defies historicity. It defies what ownership means. What happens to the concept of indigenousness within who is an American and who isn't? Do indigenous people have no claim? By redefining what it means to be American as white, what happens what happens to the history of indigenous people and to everyone else around the world? Does the inclusion of other ways of speaking English, such as Nigerian English, point to a new way of thinking about whiteness and its global reach, or is it just another incorporation of whiteness around the globe? Here, I kind of want to flip the script on global whiteness, that it's not just about U.S. expansionism and the power of the United States globally. It's also about how the rest of the world calls upon the U.S. to help advance the project of whiteness. As the largest and most powerful white country today, other people view the potential power of this whiteness. Whether the United States takes this path or another path remains to be seen. And here, there's a distinction that I want to make between the United States government and the people. On Yom Kippur in October 2019, Stefan B, and under the German uh, judicial system, they refer only to the first initial of the last name, Stefan B initiated an attack on a synagogue in Halle, Germany, that killed two people outside the synagogue. In a live streaming video on Twitch, he began his video with, quote, hi, my name is Anon, and continued, quote, I think the Holocaust never happened. Feminism is the cause of the decline of the West, which acts as a scapegoat for mass immigration, and the root of all these problems is the Jew. Would you like to be friends? End quote. <laughs> Later, the gunman was identified as Stefan Ballier, a German citizen. Notably, he communicated his uh, Twitch video in English. His call for more attacks did incite others. 
because of the global network of, of whiteness uh, through social media. Quote, the attack inspired copycat terrorists around the world, including the United Kingdom, Norway, and the American cities of El Paso, Texas, and Poway, California, where a synagogue was attacked. In, end quote, in February 2020, Tobias R., another German citizen, posted a YouTube video prior to opening fire on two shisha bars in Hanau, Germany, killing nine people. The video was addressed to, quote, all Americans, and like Stefan B.'s statement, was done in English. I point to these recent examples of white violence to underscore the international character of whiteness today. The United States remains an important and central place for whiteness and the call for all Americans can be seen as a call for white Americans to help re-secure the dominance uh, of whiteness and white supremacy. Let me briefly say that the internet, social media, and the online environment today play an important role in whiteness, especially on the global stage. There's much work to be done here and I've only begun to scratch the surface. Whiteness, of course, is more than just white violence, white supremacy, and white nationalism. It's also a normalization and a cultural logic in everyday life. It is Trumpism and the imagined return to a time when America was great. It wants to become Americanism, but is that who we are? One here, I want to return to, the, to Benjamin Franklin and point to his legacy and nation building, which is also race building. Um, and he's left us with a legacy of the United States as a white majority society. There's a lot at stake in the coming years. Is America about racial division and categorizations and some the suppression of some languages as it was in the past? Or is it about moving beyond these racial divisions and accepting a multicultural, multilingual, polyglot society in a diverse world? Our task is not to predict the future, but to understand the history and cultural logic at work that might shape our future and finding points of intervention as we move forward. Thank you for listening and considering my ideas.